We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Okay, well, it's a, it's a great honor to be here, and I thank the organizers, Nick and Ajit, for uh, inviting me, and also all of you for uh, coming. So, I would like to start by showing you a video clip of uh, something that we filmed last summer in Gorongosa National Park in uh, Mozambique. So, Gorongosa is an amazing uh, biodiversity hotspot, and we have here what looks like a fairly kind of peaceful scene. So, we have a troop of baboons resting and feeding, we've got some warthogs. Uh, walking around, we've got some water buck uh, grazing and so on. So it's all quite idyllic. Uh, but of course, nature is rarely idyllic. And if you look more closely, you can see that this guy here in the middle is quite um, busy doing something. And then if we um, zoom in, which we will um, in a second, we'll see that he has hunted and is now eating a young antelope, a, a reed buck. But unlike a lion with a killer bite, this baboon is eating the antelope while it's um, still alive, which you could argue is not particularly sensible, given that it means that the antelope still has um, a chance to escape, which, as, as you'll see in a second, it's still um, very much trying to do um, at this point. So for us, uh, I think this really is quite a um, sort of gruesome a scene, but at the same time, it does raise some very interesting questions that we can ask about what might be going on in that uh, baboon's head. And some of those questions actually hog back to what Nick was talking about in his introduction. So for example, does this baboon know that the antelope is still alive? Does the baboon know that the fact that the antelope is moving is a sign that it's still alive? Does the baboon know that it can kill the antelope? Um, and does it know what it needs to do to kill the antelope? And that once it has killed it, the antelope will remain dead? Um, does the baboon know that it itself will die one day and so will other, uh, all other baboons and all other antelopes and so on? Um, and then finally, you might have noticed in that video, um, the antelope's mother standing to one side. So another question could uh, be, I think, will the antelope's mother grieve um, for her calf? So I, I can't promise to be able to answer most or even any of these questions, uh, but what I will um, try to do in this talk is to first survey what kinds of responses have been recorded among non-human animals um, to dead individuals, and what, what these re responses might tell us about um, uh, the kind of underlying death-related concepts um, in these animals. Um, and then at the end, I will also briefly consider grief specifically, um, as well as what implications a better understanding of these phenomena might have for animal welfare. Okay. So um, on this graphical summary, what I tried to do was to put together, um, uh, to give you an idea basically of the orders of mammals, so the taxonomic orders of mammals from which we have published scientific reports uh, on responses to death. And I think one of the things that quickly pops out is that these reports cover quite a broad uh, taxonomic uh, spread, although some orders are represented by just one or a few um, species. And that, of course, doesn't mean that uh, mammals in other orders don't respond to the dead. It's just that we don't have yet have good kind of published um, uh, reports on them. 
So, for example, we don't really know a great deal about how bats or aardvarks or kangaroos um, respond to the dead, although for at least some of these kind of missing pieces, we do have some um, anecdotal uh, evidence that, that exists. Um, just not scientifically published yet. So we'll come back to this figure later when we look at what specific ways uh, there are of animals' responses uh, or animals' treatment of the dead. But first, what I want to do now is to quickly tell you about three chimpanzee uh, case uh, reports that we observed at our um, field research site, which is coordinated by Kyoto University uh, and which is located in uh, Bosu in Guinea, West Africa. And they're each kind of incredibly striking cases, I think, things you see, you know, once you see them, you don't easily forget them. All three cases involved young individuals, young infants, so Jokro, uh, Jimato, and Veve, um, each of whom died of a suspected respiratory illness before they turned um, three years old. Uh, and these dead infants, they weren't abandoned by the mothers, but they continued to be carried and to be looked after, to be groomed and protected, uh, much like live animals of this age uh, would be by their mothers. And over the course of the carrying, uh, all three infants uh, mummified. And, and the, the length of the carrying was really extraordinary. So in the first case, uh, carrying continued for more than 27 days. In the second case, for 68 days. Um, and then in the third case, for 19 days. And it's extraordinary for many reasons, but one of the reasons is that this length of carrying, really amazing, because the, the, you know, the, the, the infants have to be carried in ways that no uh, live infant ever is because they, you know, they could no longer hold on to their, their mother and they could, they could no longer cling. So they really encumbered the mothers. They had to be carried um, in, in uh, unusual ways. So for example, between, uh, sorry, by, by grasping a limb between the neck and the shoulder, which is what you see in these images here when, when the mothers were walking, or by climbing and then, um, sorry, when climbing, holding the body between the thigh and the belly, the so-called um, thigh pocket in the chimpanzee, that's what you see in this image, or even by dangling uh, just by the foot when, when resting in the trees. And the mothers um, also continued to groom the bodies and they swatted flies from them. Uh, you're seeing that in that, in that video. Um, and the grooming in particular, um, I think you can interpret in different ways, I guess. So you could, for example, argue that the mothers, these mothers don't know that their infants are dead and they continue to treat them as alive or that they do know that the infants are not alive, uh, not alive but they choose to keep them uh, clean anyway. Um, and then group mates other than the mother also showed um, a lot of interest in the body. So we saw a number of different responses uh, from these individuals. They ranged from investigatory behaviors like smelling and touching and inspecting or lifting limbs and dropping them to, uh, to dragging and pulling and playing with the, with the corpses, but also to caretaking and attendance. So this, for example, here is, the, is this dead infant's uh, grandmother who sat by the corpse while the mother was off um, feeding and she groomed it and she swatted flies, um, flies from it. And the mothers were generally quite tolerant to these behaviors, even if it meant relinquishing possession of the corpses temporarily. So you see this one particular mother here, and there's the corpse left behind. And this is a juvenile that comes in uh, quite cautiously, picks up uh, the corpse, and, and carries it off. And you see the mother initially, she turns around, she sort of gets up as if she was making to go uh, to get the uh, corpse back. But eventually, she just sort of lets, um, lets the juvenile run off with it um, and play. And again, this is not too dissimilar to uh, what a live infant of this age would be allowed to do. Two-year-olds do still travel with the mother at all times, but when the group is stationary, the mothers do allow these infants to, um, to wander off um, and, and play with others in, in the group. Um, and then interestingly, or maybe importantly, we never saw any aggression being directed towards the corpses. Although in one case, this is the one case when an adult male used one of these uh, bodies in a display during a fight. So this was at the point when the body had already completely mummified. But even here, uh, I think this seemed like rather kind of gentle handling of the corpse. He's not tearing it to pieces. He's not sort of flinging it around, but actually sort of quite softly just pulls it along the ground um, and then gently switches hands when... Um, when he turns around. Um, and just lastly, I want to show a clip that illustrates a kind of combination of different responses. So here, first of all, we've got um, an infant uh, playing with the corpse. And I think he's sort of veering between fear and curiosity, really, um, until it seems like curiosity gets the, the better of him. 
And so this is the dead infant's mother, and this is the live, so this infant's uh, mother. And, and if you watch carefully, you'll see that that live um, infant's mother is also peering at, at the body with curiosity. But then she, uh, in, in, the, in a moment, she'll, see, she'll show what might be seen as a sort of aversion to the corpse. So watch this. So she doesn't really, you know, she's, she's happy for her infant to play with, with the corpse, but she really doesn't want to be um, touched by it. So, you know, having said that, this was really the only time when we saw any, any individual respond in this way. So, so, so far I've talked about uh, dead infant care in chimpanzees, but this is something that is seen very broadly among primates. We have examples, for example, from uh, geladas, mountain gorillas, um, orangutans, lemurs, and some of it on a really huge scale. So Sugiyama and his colleagues, for example, um, documented over 150 cases of dead infant carrying over uh, 24 years of observation on Japanese macaques. And in each case, really, the theme is the same. Uh, the mothers continue to show maternal behavior um, toward their dead infants. Um, and furthermore, the behavior isn't restricted to primates. So other mammals have been seen to care for and to transport dead infants. So uh, dolphins and whales, for example, carry dead calves. Um, dingoes and elephants stay with their deceased young. Or um, this uh, giraffe here from uh, Fred Berkovich's observations remains with and is, is sort of nudging her, her dead calf in this picture. So, and, and the behavior itself is generally um, explained in terms of the persistence of this extremely strong um, mother-infant bond um, in these species. It's particularly strong in mammals where uh, the mother really invests a huge amount into each of her offspring. And then if we also add in uh, non-infant deaths, so older individuals, there too we have some of the same responses that we, see for inf- that we saw for infants, so caretaking, like grooming, uh, then inspection and attendance by the body, but also things that indicate maybe more negative or, con- or sort of conflicted psychological states, such as alarm calling or, um, or, or aggression, and even cannibalism and, and sexual behavior in some cases. And I think there are some more kind of nuanced uh, response classes as well, but the majority really do, um, the majority which are reported in these, in in this large collection of papers, which I'm going to make use of next, can be classed into uh, one or uh, other of these kind of broad uh, categories. So then on the next slide, I'm going to try to show you graphically how these different responses are distributed among the the mammalian orders and species that we saw um, at the beginning. So for example, in chimpanzees, other authors have reported aggression towards corpses, including those of of infants um, and even cannibalism. Um, And then in other species as well, we see quite a sort of broad um, spectrum of of, uh, responses from caretaking to, uh, to to sexual behavior. Uh, but I should say that, so some of these descriptions, I think, are more complete than, and, than others, and obviously for some orders we have information on the treatment only of dead infants, but not of dead adults, or vice versa. So I think this is maybe best seen as really just a snapshot of our current um, knowledge, very much just an emerging uh, picture. But it does mean that, I think at le- we can say that at least these responses are present in these different um, orders and species. So then the important question of of what drives these different responses, what might determine when individuals respond with caretaking and when with aggression or alarm? Um, And uh, several people here have um, uh, discussed interesting potential ideas. So for example, a death where the cause is clear, so so let's say a predator attack, uh, may lead to less, say, uh, alarm calling than um, than, a ca- than a case where the cause is unclear, so like a t- an opaque illness, for example. Then uh, state of decomposition, so how much like a live animal uh, the corpse looks. It may be that less decomposed corpses elicit more kind of normal or, or stronger reactions. Then the diseased um, social, the, the diseased social status, um, so an alpha male, a dead alpha male would generate more interest than a, than a more peripheral male or, um, or, or an infant that's not yet socially, fully socially integrated. Also the deceased social relationship to the, um, uh, to the individual. So a mother will respond, probably will respond differently to her own dead offspring than to an unrelated group mate. Uh, also, uh, Christoph Bosch interestingly suggests that groups that live in high predation uh, habitats have more frequent encounters with and therefore a more kind of sophisticated knowledge um, of death uh, 
while in a sort of similar vein, Katie Cronin's team suggests that a chimpanzee mother with a dead infant is actively seeking sensory um, information on the corpse, which may inform her future behavior should another one of her infants um, die. So we might be seeing not only these kinds of proximate uh, body cue and relationship quality effects, but also learning um, about death in, in, determining, in determining what responses we see. Uh, but perhaps there's also a slightly different way of, of looking at this if we wanted to split things up uh, by sort of underlying psychological states. So there are some, some reactions that might fall under um, sort of normal interactions, and, and those might suggest that there's a lack of understanding that the state of that individual has changed. Uh, although I think even that's not entirely clear um, uh, in all cases. But at some point, uh, we begin to see behaviors that suggest that such recognition has indeed taken place. And I think stemming from this recognition, we may find um, things like curi curiosity, curious exploration of the body, and we may find fear, um, so fearful responses like alarm calling. Uh, but essentially, I think that uh, what we might be seeing is that, is that at the intersection of these things is a recognition by the individual that something's not right. So even though this corpse may look normal, it doesn't act normal. When I try to play with it, it, does, it doesn't join in. When I hit it, it doesn't respond. So in a way, the corpse um, violates expectations, as, as Andre Gonsalves calls it, to, to which you might respond with um, curiosity or fear or some combination of these, um, of these two. But if, if that is the case, um, then this can in turn tell us about what those expectations are that non-human animals have. And that comes back to those questions that I um, raised at the very beginning uh, for the baboon. Do they know the difference between animate and inanimate things? What cues do they use to tell the difference between things that are alive um, and things that aren't alive, um, and so on? And of course, these are some of the exact same questions that developmental psychologists are asking in studying um, children's understanding of animacy um, and death. And it also links to the um, motivation behind uh, comparative thanatology, uh, thanato this recently emerged field that seeks um, evolutionary roots to death-related behavioral and psychological uh, phenomena. So the idea is that by using information from species that are both um, closely and distantly related to humans, we can gain insight into the evolutionary origins of our own um, responses to, to the dead. So, and then uh, returning to grief, um, although I think the adaptive value of grief is, is, is unclear to us. It's, in other words, it's not, it's not entirely clear what the function of grief is. It could be, um, it could be a signal to attract uh, support from others, or simply it could be a, just a byproduct of, uh, of the processes that maintain the strong, those strong uh, social bonds in the first place, and they linger even once that individual has passed away, one of the individuals has passed away. But um, having said that, there are um, among <clears throat> non-humans, excuse me, quantifiable behavioral and uh, hormonal responses that accompany the loss of an individual with a, clo a close social bond. So we see loss of appetite, loss of sleep, withdrawal from the social group, uh, things like lethargy, and even um, elevated stress hormones. And, and so given all of this, I think I agree with um, Barbara King's perspective here that it's possible to decouple um, grief from, from the awareness of death. So you don't have to know what death is um, in order to be able to grieve. Um, and then finally, uh, that brings us to this um, last point, which is that managing grief is something that we perhaps um, ought to bear in mind explicitly when devising management plans for dying zoo uh, individuals or, or even pets. So in zoos, dying animals are often separated uh, from, their, from their normal social groups. And pets that are about to be euthanized are also often separated from their uh, companions. But this can lead to extended periods of uh, searching and distress in those companions that get left behind. So alternatives to these practices might uh, be seen as more um, humane. So this here um, is the chimpanzee Pansy, um, who was allowed to die in the company of her social group um, at, at a Scottish zoo. And Jim Anderson and colleagues who've studied um, that particular case argue that that this allowed those others in the group um, uh, that, that remained behind to gain a sense of the fact that Pansy wasn't, um, wasn't coming back. So if we consider the welfare of the animals that stay behind, then it may, I think it may be better to allow death not to happen kind of removed in space um, and out of sight, 
but actually in the presence um, of, of the others with whom that individual uh, shares a close um, uh, uh, social bond. And that might prevent extended distress in these close affiliates and, and also allow animals to learn um, about the dying process and about the finality of death. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for the opportunity to come and talk with you today. I'm going to speak about our work on uh, how crows and other birds recognize and respond to their dead. The message is fairly simple from what we know at this point. I think um, that it mainly is an opportunity for them to learn uh, about sources of death and uh, places to avoid and perhaps uh, other objects in the environment to avoid. So I see it as a real arena for learning. Before I get into the crows, I wanted to step back to the mammals for just a second and relate a uh, quite an interesting observation I had in Yellowstone National Park about four years ago um, to this day. And at this point, we were with a group of students looking at a wolf kill, trying to assess the landscape that might have contributed to this death. And it was an old female that had died. She'd been killed about two weeks earlier. And uh, the, the death scene was one of a large cleft boulder. The female had backed into that. It was a bison that had been killed by a pack of wolves. And uh, we were measuring the aspects of the terrain and the, the situation. There was a lot of still blood stained on the rock and the bones of the dead female bison on the ground. And as we were busying ourselves, we heard a roar of hooves come over the ridge. And the whole herd of about three dozen bison displaced us from that scene. And uh, we felt pretty, pretty bad for having been there and, and, and interrupted this situation. But the thing that was impressive was that these bison, after they pushed us away, they all smelled the bones, much as we heard with other mammals. And then each one individually walked through this cleft in the rock, right where the female had been killed, and passed through and then went on their way. They, they were there for about an hour in total. And that's very different than we see with the response to when a crow finds a dead. Uh, dead animal. So what you see in this video are the responses of crows uh, to finding a dead bird that we placed on the ground right below that telephone pole. They come in, they're very noisy, they gather, and they, they might last for 15 or 20 minutes before they move on out of the area. And this is a widespread response that's been seen in other uh, members of this family, the Corvidae, uh, that includes things like magpies, uh, which have been seen to even bring tufts of uh, grass into a dead magpie, or scrub jays. There's been a lot of work on scrub jays just north of us here, and, and also ravens gathering around the dead. So let me introduce you to this family of birds briefly. They're birds that are familiar to most of us. They live close by with us. They include the ravens and crows, magpies, jays, nutcrackers. And they, they uh, live around the world in all the continents except Antarctica. And almost all of these species have had some sort of interaction, uh, as I described with the crows, to finding the dead. So some aspects of this group, they're long-lived, they're typically social, they have uh, long-lasting partnerships with their mates and, and sometimes extended family groups. They have rather large brains for their body size. On this graph, these show the average relationships between body size uh, on the uh, x-axis and brain size on the y-axis for things like fish. And here's the average bird line. And then you'll see that the dots uh, for the various corvids are well above the bird line, more on the mammal line, and even some like the American crow that I study right on the primate line. So these are really more like small flying monkeys than they are birds. Their brains are quite complex. Uh, we know now in the last several decades that they include places in the brain that are analogous and also hom homologous to ours. For example, the hippocampus is a uh, homologous structure. and the. Uh, um, the amygdala is an, at least an analogous structure. They have uh, a large forebrain, all this area here. There's a striatum, but a large forebrain where more complex sorts of sensory information might be combined and considered. And they have important connections between the uh, forebrain and um, the, the thalamus back up to the forebrain that allows these animals to reconsider actions and shape them before they act upon those, uh, that information. So the typical response is to get some information in, maybe from the eye, process it in the forebrain, and send a response down the uh, spinal cord to the muscles to do something. 
but they don't have to always do that because of a connection here that allows that information to go back to the forebrain and be adjusted. That's how they, for example, learn different vocalizations. So with an animal like that, long-lived, social, uh, and um, quite cognitively nimble, uh, there are many reasons why they might attend their dead, as we discussed just uh, with Dora's presentation. So they may be looking at a social opportunity, a vacant territory, a potential mate, for example. They may be looking to learn about danger. Uh, they may be um, looking at, at other aspects of that scene to learn what caused the, the death, what sort of expectation in the future uh, that area may hold for danger and, and things like that. They may also be grieving and mourning uh, a lost member of their family. Or, as I said, since these animals mate for life, they might have been with the same individual that's dead now for 20 or 30 years and might have a profound relationship and interaction with that animal after it's lost. So we have tried to investigate this uh, response by doing experiments. And what we do is we uh, basically prepare taxidermy mounts of individual crows and, and, and have them in kind of a dead status. And then we place those out and see the response of wild birds to those, um, to those mounts. And this is a general description, basically, of what we do. There's some sort of a conditioning phase where we get animals used to coming to an area. Then we present them with some st uh, stimulus. Uh, that could be a dead crow or, or a hawk, for example, just to see the response. And then we measure their response after they've encountered that. And during this time, we've been feeding them at a spot, so we know they reliably come in. They're using that spot to gain food. And we can look for a change in their behavior, maybe how long it takes for them to approach that food after they've seen a dead bird there. So what we found, and this is work I should say that uh, my PhD student Kaylee Swift and I have been engaged in, and Kaylee's continuing this work now, but these are some of the early findings that she uh, discovered. First off, in terms of how many gatherings occur around these dead uh, crows, about 60% of all the, the crows we put out had a large mob form around them. And that's similar to what you would see if a hawk was present, uh, which is a known danger. And it's not as often uh, as you would see if a hawk had a dead crow in its grip, for example. That almost always elicits this sort of response. So from this, comparing to um, more controlled situations where just a person is there feeding uh, or uh, just food is provided, suggests that this is some sort of response to danger for sure. And we know that uh, the individuals are learning something about being in this dangerous place uh, because the approach to the food is quite different after a danger has been seen versus uh, not been seen. So here, you just see the amount of time uh, pre and post exposure to a stimulus. Uh, in this case, the stimulus is just food or a person, nothing dangerous, no difference. And if the, if the stimulus is a hawk or a dead crow, much longer time to approach that food after seeing that. And this, this uh, kind of narrows that response because actually in some cases the birds re refused to come down to food at a place they had seen a dead crow for up to six to eight weeks. And this is different uh, also depending upon uh, whether it's a crow or a pigeon that they see. So they're very sensitive to the type of stimulus. They avoid places after seeing a dead crow, uh, even though they had been feeding there before. But if a dead pigeon is placed there, there's no real response, no difference. And also, um, crows do this, and not, not all birds do this. So we just control this by looking at the response of pigeons, uh, as well as crows, to this sort of uh, presentation. And when, when pigeons see a place they've been fed at that now has a dead pigeon at it, they continue to feed there afterwards like nothing had happened. I suspect turkeys, we've been seeing some turkey videos of turkeys walking around a dead cat today, and I suspect they, they act like pigeons in this respect. But crows clearly increase their hesitancy to approach a spot after they've seen uh, a dead animal there. And this is a pretty nuanced response as well. So what, we've seen, what we see in this graph is that the response to an adult crow that's dead versus a juvenile crow that's dead over here uh, is different, and that's especially different during the uh, breeding uh, season. So when you find a dead juvenile crow in the breeding season, which is a fairly common um, response, a lot of young birds die, birds, the adult crows and other crows in the area don't pay much attention to that. They only scold and form a mob about a third of the time. Likewise, during the breeding season, if an adult is found, scolding and mobbing is not as common as it is during the non-breeding season. 
So this sort of nuanced response to me suggests that this sort of behavior is triggered more by an ecological uh, or uh, more of a um, social or ecological factor than it is perhaps something like grieving or um, mourning the loss of this individual. In fact, I would expect the exact opposite if they were really uh, considering, for example, a lost young bird of their own, their sibling or their um, offspring or their mate, you would expect those responses to be especially strong during the breeding season, for example, and especially strong um, among adult birds. So we've tried to understand where in the brain the crow uh, is processing this information and using that to help explain a little bit more about why they're doing this sort of thing. And let me explain our um, procedure to you a little bit here in this slide. We're doing pet imaging of live crows as they view uh, various sorts of dangerous stimuli, a hawk, a person that had just captured them, or a person holding a dead crow, for example. And what we do, uh, shown up here at the top, is we, we capture our birds in the wild. Um, we wear a mask when we capture them so that they learn a particular face associated with that dangerous experience being captured uh, in the wild. We capture them with a net gun that goes off with a blast and pins them to the ground. It's a pretty scary thing for a bird. And we don't want them to associate that with us when we see them later. And we want to be able to have anybody take on the role of that dangerous person by putting on this mask. So we wear a mask when we catch them. Uh, we then bring the birds into captivity and care for them wearing a different mask. So we have one person that's good here caring for the birds and one person that's bad that has captured the bird. And we keep the birds for about a month. And during this time, we bring them into a, a smaller cage shown in the middle uh, diagram here, uh, where they are acclimated overnight. And then the next morning, we perform a procedure upon them. And that procedure is simply to, to catch the bird out of the cage, inject it with a, um, with a uh, glucose mimic that we use as a tracer to indicate where synaptic activity, where uh, nerve cells are uh, actively communicating with one another. And um, we then put them back in that cage after they've been given the shot of glucose in their belly. And then we show them something. We let them, while they're awake, look out and observe perhaps uh, just a person in the room that they never seen. They could observe the person that caught them or the person that cared for them or a person holding a dead crow or a hawk or nothing at all. And then uh, during that 20 minutes or so, we continue to let them see that person on and off and we then anesthetize them. And this tracer with the PET imaging allows us to basically step back in time while they're anesthetized and see where in the brain uh, that tracer has accumulated during the time when they were actually looking at that stimulus we gave them. So this way we can keep them still, get a nice image, and uh, see what's going on in their brain, then wake them up, let them rest for a day, let the tracer, the radioactive tracer clear, and they can be released back to the wild. So for example, here's uh, what a crow would see if it was sitting in our cage, uh, metabolizing that glucose we gave it, and looking out and seeing a person it had never seen before holding a dead crow. The images we get of their brain are, are striking. They show uh, relative activity by how bright uh, the areas are here. This is the, um, the, the glucose fluorescing, basically, in the tomography. And what you see here are bright spots on either hemisphere of the brain, which are the entopallium of the bird. That's the visual processing center of a bird's brain, assessing information coming from the two eyes here. I'm going to show you a set of graphs that look somewhat like this, figures that basically show MRIs in gray to show you the structure of the bird's brain, and then the red areas indicate what parts of the brain were most activated in a given set of birds that saw one thing versus a set of birds that saw something quite different. And in this case, this shows the part of the brain, and this is the front part of the bird's brain, that's activated when they saw a person in the room versus nobody else in the room. So any kind of person in this case, there's a lot of um, higher order processing occurring in the forebrain of these birds as they consider that person and also in the striatum as they possibly are making connections between that person and something that it had previously done. Now if we look at them in response to basically how they see particular people, what we have on the top panel here is the response of birds when they looked out and they saw uh, the person that had previously captured them, so a dangerous person. And they're recalling at this point 
uh, something about that person. They already know that he was dangerous, and now what we see activated most clearly, in addition to that frontal area that I showed previously, is their amygdala. So they're basically responding like other vertebrates do with a strong response in the right hemisphere of their brain in the amygdala reason, region that indicates they're responding to a, a known danger, a, a learned danger, I should say. In contrast, when they see a person that they've never seen before and they're learning about that person's behavior because it's holding a dead crow, what is activated most strongly is the hippocampus in the bird. So what, what we interpret is going on here is that these birds are acquiring information, they're learning about this, this dangerous person by its association with a dead crow, and in this case, they're recalling a, a, something already learned. We know something about the way information proceeds from the eyes up to the bird's brain, and I just show you this diagram uh, to point out the complexity with which this uh, information travels from the retina up through the basal ganglia and into the forebrain. Uh, and it's a, it's a rather simple picture, actually, when they're looking at um, a person that they've learned to be threatening as compared to the... Uh, to the situation when they're first assessing somebody that's potentially dangerous by, in, in fact, holding this dead crow. So here the hippocampus is involved as well as the forebrain and the visual processing centers. And in this case, it's mainly the forebrain and the visual processing centers interacting. So all of these field experiments and laboratory experiments basically point me to one conclusion. When we show a crow, a dead uh, crow that's, that's not a familiar individual, that they're responding and learning about that situation. Perhaps the person associated with it or the place associated with that death. Quite, quite clear, I think, in this respect to me. But what else could we be missing? And to me, this is the more interesting uh, part of the work that we, we basically, I can only tell you, I don't know. Uh, but I hope to find out at some point. But this is a pair of ravens uh, interacting with one another. They form very close relationships, and surely, I would guess, we would see differences in the brain activity of a bird after it had lost its mate than if it just uh, encounters a dead bird that it doesn't know personally. But we haven't done that experiment. It's something that, that could be done, but, but ethically is difficult to do. There are other things that suggest there may be a lot more going on than just learning about a site, and these are more anecdotal observations. I mentioned earlier that when magpies come into their dead, they've been observed to carry grass. And maybe that's just the nesting material that they were carrying uh, when they encountered that, or maybe it was something more purposeful. So for example, in crows, this picture shows uh, one that was found that was surrounded by these sticks. There were no trees around. There was nothing where these sticks could have just been there incidentally. Maybe a, a human put them there, or perhaps the crow uh, had come in and put those sticks around this dead crow. We don't know, but I have several observations like this from people. And then uh, finally, just a, a week ago, a woman sent me this image, which she took on the Michigan State uh, University campus. And what you see here is a crow that is looking at a, a dead crow. The dead crow has only uh, uh, recently died. The woman suggested it might have hit a window or something by the looks of it. And this bird flew in, totally silent, brought this piece of tin foil in its bill and set it down in front of the dead crow. And it stood there for 20 minutes watching this. I have no idea if these are a mated pair or if, again, this was anything other than incidental, but it's curious to me that they didn't scold, this bird didn't scold, and didn't attract a crowd in like we regularly see. So I think there's much more going on here than we know, and it will take much more sophisticated experiments to get at them, uh, which hopefully we'll do in the future. And with that, I would thank you very much for your attention. So I'm also very grateful uh, for this invitation. Um, I think it's, I, I haven't been this excited about death for, for a long time. <laughs> so just to set the context of my talk a little bit, you'll remember when Dora uh, presented the baboon slides and the various questions that we might ask of those baboons um, with respect to their understanding of death. What I'll be telling you, I think, in part today, is that the answer to many of those questions with respect to children at a fairly young age is yes, that they, they have an understanding. But then I'll go on to say more about how that understanding might be displaced or amplified um, 
by the notions of afterlife or religion that their particular culture um, presents to them. So that's the, the gist of the presentation. Uh, some acknowledgements here. Uh, my good colleague Rita Astuti, whom you'll be hearing more from this afternoon. Uh, Marta Gimenez, with whom I did some research in Spain. Three colleagues at the University of Texas. I'll mention them later when I talk about some, some work in Vanuatu. So, as I've said, children probably acquire, and certainly by the age of seven or eight, have acquired <clears throat> um, what we might think of as a biological theory of death. That's to say they seem to understand that death is a terminal point for all mental and bodily processes. And indeed, children of this age, seven, eight, nine, it varies a little bit from child to child, also seem to understand the universality of death, that it applies to everybody, that it's irreversible. And it's also true that they understand something of the mechanics of death. That's to say that the, the body is a, is a machine, that there are various parts, invisible parts, lungs, heart, and so forth, which have to be coordinated. And when those parts break down, then death is inevitable with various uh, consequences. At the same time, children will encounter um, uh, a religious account or a supernatural account. And part of what I want to discuss, as I mentioned a moment ago, is the relationship in the child's mind between these two different accounts. So in order to explore that question of the relationship between the two accounts, we, that's to say myself and Marta Gimenez, tested children um, of five years of age, sorry, seven years of age and uh, 11 years of age in Spain. Yeah. I mentioned Spain advisedly in some sense because of course these children were therefore growing up in a particular religious culture. The children were not just quizzed about their, as it were, immediate or biological conception of death, but we tried to prompt uh, their religious conception as well. And we did this therefore in the context of two different stories. One about the death of a grandparent and at the end of the story, the, the, the grandchild is visited by a doctor and the other also about the death of a grandparent, but in this story, the, the grandchild who's lost their grandparent is visited by a priest. So I'll just show you those two stories. As you can see toward the end here, the doctor came to talk to Juan about what had happened, and he said to Juan, your grandfather is dead now. You can see that there's no hint in this story of an afterlife or there are no religious cues. The second story, the priest story, is fairly similar. That's to say, death of a grandparent who's been ill, goes to the hospital. But as you can see at the end of the story, Marta, uh, the protagonist, is visited by a priest rather than by a doctor who explains what, what has happened and puts to Marta the claim that her grandmother is now with God. So the, each child listened to both of these stories, and after each story, <clears throat> we would ask about the functioning of various processes. Sometimes we asked about bodily processes, for example, have his eyes stopped working? And sometimes we asked about mental processes, can he still see? And as in this case, we try to choose pairings, that's to say where we would focus in on a bodily organ and an accompanying uh, mental process. We couldn't always do that, but roughly speaking, that was, that was our goal. So ultimately, the children answered um, about 14 questions, seven about the functioning of the body, seven about the functioning of the mind. The children gave their reply. They would either say this process was continuing or not. And then we would ask them to offer an explanation of why it had stopped or conversely why the process was continuing. And we found that we could um, allocate children's answers to three different um, categories. 
religious, biological, and a more equivocal set of replies. So let's just present the way in which we score children for each of those categories. So religious answers, well, in this case, the child would claim that a given process continues. So yes, he can still see. And then they, when we'd say, well, how is that? They would supply a religious explanation. In heaven, everything can work, even if she is dead, the soul keeps working and so forth. So you can see very clearly um, in, this, in these cases, uh, references to religious notions, heaven, the soul, and so forth. Now, if we turn to the biological answers, here the child claims that the process has stopped. And as you can see, they're pretty blunt about why it stopped. Um, he's been eaten by worms. He has no body, he's just bones. If he's dead, nothing can work. And then finally, no credit answers. These were replies where the child either didn't offer an explanation, or if they did so, it didn't seem to fit in with the judgment that they'd made about the, the process working or not working. So what I'm going to do next is to show you um, the replies for the seven-year-olds. And uh, just to give you a heads up, um, the uh, biological answers are black. I mean, the bars are black. The religious answers are white. And in between, you'll see some gray for equivocal, so to speak. More than that, I'll show you the extent to which the child offers religious replies or biological replies or equivocal replies with respect to those two story settings. Remember the priest story and the doctor story, and also within those two stories for um, mental processes versus bodily processes. So here's, a, as I say, an overview of the seven-year-olds. And you can see it's fairly black. That's to say, most of, the, most of the time, the children are giving biologically oriented answers. And if you look at the left-hand side of the figure where I've charted replies for the doctor stories, whether it be about the body or the mind, you can see that um, biology is dominating. But if you shift over to the two right-hand columns, you see that religion is beginning to um, get a look in, so to speak, more religious replies, and the proportion of biological answers is declining. So in other words, when you present the same child, or, uh, well, essentially the same child, yes, um, um, a story with some religious cues, they pick up on those cues and they start to interpret the, the death in a different uh, context or in a different fashion. So that's the picture for the seven-year-olds. Now we can ask what we will, might find with the, um, with the older children, with the 11-year-olds, and the extent to which um, biology might, so to speak, consolidate itself or religion might consolidate itself, uh, or there might be some competition between these two modes. And here's what we find. You can see that religion is um, predominating, especially when we've given the child, as you see in the two right-hand columns, those afterlife cues. So if the priest is introduced, whether the child is asked about the body or the mind, there's a lot of religious talk in their replies and, and justifications. So the next step that we took was to ask, given that we had presented each child with two stories, to ask how consistent any individual child um, might be across those two stories, and indeed across essentially the 28 questions that we had asked them. So at one extreme, a given child might be consistently biological in their answer. They might assume that death is terminal and that's that, no matter what the process and no matter what the story context. Conversely, they might be consistently religious in their answers. And finally, we could imagine an individual child who shifts their ground depending on the story context or indeed on the particular process that they're um, being invited to think about. So you'll see on, in the next slide, again, these two age groups, seven-year-olds and 11-year-olds, but I'm gonna show you the proportion of children falling into these 
three categories. So here are the findings. So you can see that the seven-year-olds, as we might have suspected from the earlier figure, approach death from a predominantly biological perspective. On the other hand, if you look at that red bar, we do see some proportion, about 30% of those seven-year-olds, who are mixing it, who go backwards and forwards, so to speak, between the biological and the religious, and a small proportion who are consistently religious. Now, if we turn to the 11-year-olds, we might have imagined that the consistently religious bar, the white bar, would be the one showing the most sharp increase between the younger children and the older children. That's not the case, as you see. What we do see is a decline in consistently biological responding and an increase in this mixed pattern of responding, where the child, depending upon the particular question we've asked, is inclined to offer a biological account or a religious account. More generally, I would say, and these data have fitted into other data, it looks as if children by the age of late uh, middle childhood, so to speak, have arrived at these two accounts. They don't necessarily think of themselves, think of the two accounts as competitors with each other. They think of them as compatible with each other. But it's also true, and this is going a little bit beyond the data, but I think it's very plausible, that the starting point for young children is the biological. So they arrive at this biological account, of which, as I said earlier, um, by seven or eight, they realize is a universal account and therefore applies to themselves. And it may be that that's the foundation, ultimately, this biological account, for their increasing appreciation of the message that is offered by religion, so to speak, which, after all, in some sense, presupposes the biological account but then denies it, which says death is not the end. So there's a sense in which, from our point of view, um, we are seeing some, a somewhat paradoxical conceptual development here where conclusions that the child has arrived at from a relatively objective point of view are going to be put aside or set aside in part by virtue of religious teaching. So there's a quick summary of what I've just reported to you. And as I've emphasized, as children get older, this mixed stance is the one that dominates. I'm going to give you a very quick taste of uh, Rita's talk by showing you a map of Madagascar. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to show you a picture of <laughs> her field site. She will tell you what happens when you go to Madagascar and you repeat um, this kind of interview uh, with children and with adults, bearing in mind that in Madagascar we're not talking about a Christian culture. We're talking about a culture which believes in the existence of the ancestors. So I'm going to move on quickly instead to Tana Vanuatu, uh, as you can see um, off the east coast of Australia. And in particular, this island of Tana is one where uh, my colleagues in Austin, led by Christine Lagarde, have been doing these kinds of interviews with children and indeed with adults um, in Tana. Okay, they took essentially the design study, the, stu the study design that I described a moment ago to Vanuatu, but they also tested adults in Austin, Texas. And the basic question was the extent to which we would find a distinctive pattern, um, particularly in Vanuatu, uh, or whether we would replicate the basic pattern we'd seen in Spain. One, it seems like a minor methodological point, but I think it's of greater significance. In this particular study, each participant was only presented with one story, not with two stories. So you could argue, looking back at the results we got in Spain, that the reason why children showed this duality, this coexistence of two accounts, was precisely because the two children have been presented with two different narratives about death. In this study, then, each participant only got one story, and we'll see if, nonetheless, we get this pattern of um, mixed responding. So that's the basic question. And I'm going to show you now the results that we got when we presented a story with afterlife cues, 
similar to the one that I mentioned a moment ago with respect to Madrid in Spain, but with certain cultural adjustments given, given, the, given the culture. The two cultures, I should say. So here are the findings. Pretty straightforward, as you can see. In both places, we see that the consistently biological is in the minority. In both places, we do see some uh, individuals who offer consistently religious responding. But the very clear result is this prevalence of mixed, of a mixed stance or mixed responding, both in the United States and in Vanuatu. So that leads me to then some overall conclusions. It looks as if from our data, and actually that's echoed um, not just in Spain, but also in Madagascar, that young children don't really um, pay much heed to the religious narrative which is available in their culture. They come to an understanding of death in biological terms, and pro more probing interviews than those I've presented to you today suggest, as I mentioned earlier, that this is part of a theory in the sense that the children also can invoke various unobservable bodily organs and realize that the body is coherent or has to work coherently um, for life to continue. And when life stops, you see a termination of most processes. So children have established that notion um, by around seven or eight years of age. As that theory or account is consolidated, it seems as if they become more receptive to the existing theological, supernatural, or religious account that exists in their culture. And that, but, but having said that, it's not as if that religious stance leads them to forget or suppress what they know about biology. So what you see among large numbers of people in all of these populations is a tendency to oscillate between the two accounts. And to the best of our uh, knowledge, um, these two accounts are not perceived to be in conflict with one another. And I think Rita will present you with more ethnographic evidence um, this afternoon that indeed people move rather smoothly from one account to the other. Now let me just try to say one or two words about the broader implications then of these developmental findings for the more comparative approach that we uh, will be reviewing in the course of today. So these developmental findings may or may not point to what happened in the course of human history, and they may or may not point to um, ideas that we can bring to primatology in particular. Could it be that primates have some minimal biological understanding, and should we assume that um, the religious notion, of course, would ultimately, in the human species, build on that biological notion, which is already uh, hinted at um, in our close cousins. Let me stop there. Thank you. <laughs>